Welcome to the ABQ Accent, where catalysts, innovators, and risk takers share what their accent is on their work. Like a spoken accent, we all have an inflection or emphasis on where we put our energy. Join us to learn how these folks are putting their accents to work, building their vision of the future, and how you can get involved. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Mariah, and this is the ABQ Accent. I'm here with Christy Dorr, the Executive Director of Groundworks New Mexico. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Um, I was going to call and check to see what your favorite color was so I could get the flowers right, but I actually think that you might appreciate just some purple vibrance today. I love it. Mm -hmm. Right on. So, um, I'm going to go over just briefly a little bit about what I do know of you, and then I'd love for you to expand more, and we can talk about how we met and where we're at and our future working together. Yes. Okay. So Christy Dorr is the executive director, as I said, of Groundworks New Mexico. It's a statewide organization, um, and it's specifically charged with connecting, strengthening, and advocating for New Mexico's social sector. And for, for in, in other words, the nonprofit sector um, you're, you are a licensed attorney. I'd love to know how you made those decisions, too, like your education track. Uh, and published, uh, published author. There's nothing listed here for what you've published. I'm, I'm intrigued as to what I should add to my reading list. And with over 20 years of experience in the nonprofit management, you're now focusing uh, with Groundworks on the core values of racial equity, collaboration, community, and impact, which I love all of those. So coming from school in Vermont uh, and also living abroad, I'm excited to hear about that. I spent some time in Ireland, but not Scotland. Oh, nice. So, um, and then you do also do some volunteer work with refugee children and um, with refugee and children's organizations, yeah. right? And last, of course, but not least, you um, note that you are an residing on the unceded ancestral lands of the Southern Tiwa people, and welcome to the accent. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here with you and with all of our community members. Right. Yeah. And and that's kind of where our audience is right now. It's a lot of locals and a lot of people who know what's going on in town. But I think that yeah. your pr particular perspective with what is happening um, with our social sector, which is a really powerful sector in New Mexico, is also unique. And so I'd love to know what your background is and what brought you to the work. Yeah. So I been really excited about nonprofit work my whole life. Mm -hmm. It was just, um, yeah, I think finding ways to be active in the community and I've always been that uh, bleeding heart emotional uh -huh. person. So really whether it was something that was environmental for me um, or if it was, you know, something that I just saw needed support in the community, that was really how I came to the work. Mm -hmm. And so my first jobs uh, in college were working for uh, city government mm -hmm. and also working for nonprofit organizations. And that was naturally kind of how I got into the work. So my very first, my first real job, oh. quote unquote, was working uh, for the Girl Scouts here in New Mexico. Oh. And yeah, that, uh, that really sort of sealed the deal for me, you know, having been an activist in college yeah. and mm -hmm. figuring out how do I translate this passion and interest into something that is something I get to do every day. I love that. That's awesome. What were you doing with the Girl Scouts? I was in membership. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I got to work with parents and kids and schools and going out to our communities, um, both in the city of Albuquerque and then some of our rural communities that needed some extra support. We would go out and work with some of those folks, which was a fantastic way mm -hmm. to get to really see community Mm -hmm. and people and just how they're how they're living their day-to-day -day lives and what kind of things we can do to um, bring that engagement and joy to communities mm -hmm. and start them young right yeah Girl Scouts start really young and then they have a trajectory of a of service that I think incorporate service is incorporated in most everything they do absolutely absolutely yeah. and it was really wonderful because even this was you know oof, or 20 years ago, I think. Um, but even back then, we were still working with um, kids that were, you know, not just girls. It was mm. everybody. So we would go out into schools and we would just bring the programs because the need here in New Mexico, as you know, is huge. Yeah. And so our focus was really just here's the program that we have. Um, how can we get kids interested and excited about things? Mm -hmm. And let's just go and show up as they need us to. That's cool. 
Yeah. Well, and that, and that kind of sets you up for understanding what some of those communities need. Maybe later down the road, you've been able to connect your work to some of what you saw then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, tell me more about, um, Vermont to Denver to New Mexico and back and forth and yeah where, where that um so I'm a, I'm a southwesterner so I, I grew up here in the southwest mm-hmm. and then um I don't know I so I wanted to go to Vermont was law school and I was really um passionate about environmental mm. uh and natural resources and so basically just chose the law school because it was the top environmental law school in the country and I so that's that. how yeah. I ended up there mm-hmm. um it was very it also really aligned with my personal values it's really focused on social justice Mm -hmm. and um, finding ways that we can we can all activate our communities so it really connected um, with me personally and it was an amazing school to be a part of sure yeah what else after that? Yeah, so then um, I kind of always knew that I would go back into nonprofit. So unlike most lawyers, mm-hmm. I went to the work going, I want to be an executive director, mm-hmm. and I want to figure out how I can... I always saw things as systems work yeah. and systems wide. And so to me, having that background was really about how can I give myself the skills that I need to navigate these complex worlds that we live in, whether it's regulations, mm-hmm. laws of you know state, federal nature, but also how do we get the skill set, that this strong skill set that's not just business management, um, you know, it kind of right. wrestled between the two, like, should I go and get a business degree? Or which one would be better serving, um, the, the end goal of, um, working in community. Mm-hmm. And so I went with law partly because my dad was also a lawyer. Mm-hmm. So I came to it from like that family, just, it was kind of in my, in my blood, if you will. Yeah, sure. Um, even though I definitely did not want to follow in his footsteps at first. And, uh, and he said, don't don't go to law school. Bad idea. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I really, I saw somehow like I was able to see this connection between having these really deep skills and, um, being able to still an issue Mm -hmm. and, figure finding that issue is really what you do in the law and it's also what you do in the social sector Mm -hmm. um really trying to find how you can serve community what is the issue that you're trying to solve um so i i practiced uh, i think i got bullied into taking the bar exam Mm -hmm. (laughs) just see it through yeah no i did i did practice for a little while and it was amazing um but i wanted to make the the leap back into nonprofit world Mm. and a natural fit was um becoming an executive director of the bar association oh not not just any old executive (laughs) director association so yeah so i made that leap from practicing law over to um running a bar association and then Mm. um decided to move back to new mexico and so got into that's how i kind of made the sleep of okay. all right I want to get back in um you know be near family and mm-hmm. that was the okay I'm gonna the career turning point of like do I stay in this or you know so when I when I was here it was really um looking for something that aligned with my interests mm-hmm. aligned with my values and um particularly in the nonprofit sector yeah well y- what you're describing about the law and, f- and finding finding a way to sort of make it work under a managerial sense, uh, it, it's something you mentioned on your LinkedIn profile is that you are a purpose-driven manager. Oh, okay. And I think that that really makes sense because there there are managers and there are purpose-driven managers. And there are, you know, there are different driven managers, whatever. Yeah. But you have um, a vision in mind that isn't just about bringing your employee workforce together, but it's a larger purpose of what's happening in the community and identifying how you can support those issues. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think however we can as individuals show up and grow our own strengths that then serve some greater community purpose is really really the thing that makes me tick. Yeah, I love that too. Um, And I'll just say also I I have a a little bit of a connection with Vermont just because I had always wanted to go to the School for International Training. Oh, yeah. There. Of course, I never made it, but I think it sort of just sticks there and and it makes sense as to why you're saying that it was the leading law school, particularly for environmental reasons. And um, you found yourself surrounded by folks that might have been like-minded that were... um, 
encouraging you to move along those 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 values based concerns that you had, and so I love that you were able to transform um, not just that particular goal that you had, but your values ex- expanded into more than just the environmental sector, into the broader sector, into into like you said, bringing people to their issues and, and supporting Absolutely. them. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny that you mentioned that you were interested in going to Vermont because I think there are so many parallels between Vermont and New Mexico, and it's really quite fascinating. I, I mean, just the number of nonprofit organizations mm-hmm. that are in these communities and um, the you know, just the grit of the people that live in both of these places, there's uh, just a deep sense of community Mm -hmm. and ability to um, figure out what we need to do for ourselves and, um, yeah, Yeah. be be good neighbors, be good good friends to one another and Mm -hmm. do work that, you know, whether it's international or whether it's Mm hyper-local, yeah, deeply engaged. Amen to the grit. Mm. Um, let's go back a little bit. I'm interested into what took you to Scotland, France, and Belgium. Was it for fun? Because I also saw that you listed your one of your passions being libraries of the world. Yes. Can I please just go on a library search trip with you? I mean, I'll take my own little index of, uh, you know, bucket list. Well, before we go to uh, Scotland, France, or Belgium, mm-hmm. I actually just went down to Artesia, New Mexico, okay. and did a tour as part of an education uh, cohort with a philanthropic philanthropic group here in New Mexico, and it was phenomenal. Yeah. The Artesian library gave me a library card. Uh-huh. Uh, she was fabulous, and we got a great tour. They have an incredible library, so if you want to yeah. go check out a cool library here in our state, go to Artesia. Yeah. Right on. Okay. And so when you are there, what are the kinds of books that you are enamored by? Ooh, I love old books. I usually go to like the special collections and we'll first just yeah. take in the smells of all the old books. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I like to, I like to look at um, history and, and biographies mm-hmm. particularly. I think we can we can learn so much from those that came before us and from the times before us mm-hmm. and you know when we're when we're worried about the times that we're living in which we can definitely be in that space right now yeah uh, it it gives me comfort to look at history and say oh you know what they they did some they came they overcame some big challenges right. and we can too take some guidance from some other folks who've been through it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, have you been to, well, maybe it's on your bucket list. What's the name of that library in Dublin at the university? Who, you know, so even though my mom is a dual citizen, Scottish and, um, U S I, and lived in Scotland, I've never been to Ireland. Mm. Feel embarrassed that I just admitted that. It's okay, but I'll tell you what, it's definitely worth going to. I mean, that library kind of sticks with you. I'll remember it by the end of the, our interview. Oh, cool. I'm really moving. And so let's keep going down this track, sort of what you're doing yeah. to build the larger capacity for us to be able to address some of the needs in the state. Via Groundworks, mm-hmm. I, I feel like you've been there two years now, mm-hmm. two and a half. Just, just over two. Yeah, see, okay, I'm good. Um, and you were coming into Groundworks New Mexico to not so much rebuild, but use what resources had already been at hand for a number of years of their work in the past at the Center for Nonprofit Excellence and working in um, the Funders Network and with United Way. So where was it when you feel like you came in, or where do you feel like it was when you came in? Because I want to give you so many kudos for what has been done in just the last two years, rebuilding your board, instituting more programming. Your second annual conference is coming up, and we'll talk about that. Third. Third annual? Third annual. I know. Um, hiring new staff, just building out the vision of what I think we all wanted it to be. Tell oh, me more. Thanks. Yeah, it's such an exciting time for us. Mm-hmm. So for those that don't know, Groundworks New Mexico uh, has been around for almost 30 years. Amazing. And we started as uh, the Northern New Mexico Association of Grant Makers, and then that organization went statewide. And in 2020, we acquired the Center for Nonprofit Excellence from go. the United Way. There we go. The connection there. Yeah. yeah. And so the... 
that that acquisition wasn't just about acquiring nonprofit programming. Mm -hmm. It was really a reorganization for us and to envision what do we need to be a social sector. We're not just serving philanthropy. We're not just serving nonprofit organizations. Right. It's how do we build this social sector ecosystem mm -hmm. where we're bringing it all together. And what I will now bring in with you is that it's that piece of how do we also work with government? Right. You know, how do we connect? the whole social sector so that our programs are aligning so that we yeah. know where the gaps are and we can work to those challenges together because it's a whole lot easier when we're doing these things in harmony with mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. And so that's really my vision for how we can um, bring this organization to tackle these great challenges yeah. is create a full ecosystem where we're all working with one another. We know what the problems are because we can't solve the problems until we really know what those issues are mm -hmm. and so doing some deep identifying with like these are some of the gaps that we're seeing yeah we're all operating in these different lanes like moving these silos out so that we're just working in collaboration yeah and that's that's a 10,000 foot view really yeah and so how do you how do you maybe describe some of the conversations you've had with and the work that that has been done um you know outside of the conference and outside of your membership activities to really hone in what what where you put your energy oh gosh i feel like uh, my energy is all over these yeah. days but well, we're doing a few different things. So we just launched a cohort, it's a leadership cohort. And this is very exciting because I think it's one of the great ways that we can figure out how to de-silo our work. Mm -hmm. And that's really nonprofit focused. And so leaders that are working in a specific area, but we're connecting people that are from different parts of the state. And so for the first time, we're connecting people from Navajo Nation up to Taos. We're connecting people that are in Las Cruces up to Albuquerque. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and finding these projects that they can work on and see how similarly situated organizations can learn from one another right. and figure out like what are where are the funding how do we start to collaborate on projects yeah. how do we start to collaborate uh, on f on funding mm -hmm. and really you know because the challenge is huge we have right. major funding issues in the state mm -hmm. and so how do how do we get ourselves from point a to point B and it's really starting to work together mm -hmm. uh, so the leadership cohort is really about creating this foundational space for us to start working together aligning this work and we launched this as part of the social sector Institute mm -hmm. so this is this is the how to really roll out the big picture plan um, okay. so the social sector Institute houses our Center for nonprofit excellence which mm -hmm. many people are familiar with or CNPE and then the Center for Strategic Partnerships. And the Center for Strategic Partnerships is focused more on the policy, the research, the publications, mm -hmm. the philanthropic work, mm -hmm. and CNPE is really focused on the programming, the services, professional development, workforce development, okay. economic impact. Mm -hmm. So those two arms of the institute, that's that's the space where we're creating the ecosystem, okay. figuring out how to align these these two areas. Mm -hmm. I love that. And the, and the first um, cohort is under the education, right? Yeah, yeah, it's an education-focused cohort. So anyone that's dealing in education systems, there are three main areas that folks are working in. Um, so we have folks that are doing uh, youth programs, mm -hmm. so kind of your typical like after-school program. Then we have the folks that are working in schools, and then kind of a third bucket that are in early childhood development. Okay. Well, and how many groups are involved right now? We have 17 cohort members right now from across the state. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's it's pretty incredible. And, and thanks to uh, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation for supporting this work. They really saw the vision that we had and wanted to support that, that when we work together, we're going to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And education is one of the top spaces that we really need to improve uh, our position in the state. 
Yeah, it makes sense that you would start with something like that. That's that's as if low hanging fruit, if you will, but not really, and because it's difficult because it's multifaceted and and especially when you're working with yeah. with organizations from across the state, they all have their own individual challenges. There might be some some overlap or some patterns, but the communication is key. I really I really would agree with that. And also these, it sounds to me like. In the way that you've curated, not just the groups themselves, but the um, experience over over the long haul, they are the ones saying, this is what we need, this, these are the issues. Instead of for it to come on yeah. high, these are our problems and this is what we need to fix, you're listening first. Absolutely. And I think that's what I try and do for everything. Mm-hmm. Instead of overlaying this map or my own vision for yeah. this is how things should be, because of course we all see this world of like, this is how I want it to be over yeah. here, yeah. but really looking to our community to help us build out the services, resources, and mm-hmm. programs that they need us to bring to them mm-hmm. and just providing that space. Mm-hmm. Because funders, I think, see a lot, but they don't see it from that level. And, and, and um, those voices of those service providers and the people that are working with their clients or whoever it may be, if you will, to day in and day out are the ones that see the long term and the big picture and the critical needs. So I, I, I appreciate that. And how much longer is the this particular cohort? And then are you doing, I mean, I know that we're, we're feeling it out. Yeah. What, do you yeah, know this what is, the next topic is? This is definitely pilot. And yeah. so we're not sure what the next topic is. Yeah. Uh, we're, you know, the big, the big issues that we're grappling with are probably the top priority mm-hmm. for the next cohort. So, um, you know, the housing crisis, yep. the um, water climate issues that we're faced with, Absolutely. Um, those are really important. But also figuring out where there's a robust philanthropic community and where government resources mm. are. Mm. And so that's also playing into this. And that was part of why the education was such a great yeah. pilot, because we already have so much happening in mm-hmm. both government and philanthropy in that area. Wow. Um, but you did sort of tee up the conference. Yes. So the cohort, the the last session is the week of the conference, okay. and so everybody from across the state, these 17 cohort members, will be um, coming to the Isleta Resort and uh, having their retreat the day before the conference, and that will also allow them to set up uh, exhibits for their organizations because we have the philanthropic community mm-hmm. as a captive audience, right. among others. Right um, it's really about showcasing their work and the work that's being done in education across our state so we'll have a very we'll have a room dedicated just to um, all of these nonprofits and the great work they're mm-hmm. doing in our state that's great and so that's in April 23rd and 24th mm-hmm. and I would recommend that people go both days all day I mean there's it's yeah it, based on my experience last year there wasn't a session I wanted to miss or would feel willing to miss I had to choose very critically and it also had to do with the people that you bring in to facilitate the um, the overall conference you have very um, you have people who are very in touch with the issues that sit on panels mm-hmm. that that lead discussions that bring in data so it's a it's a wide range of an experience it's not where you always have to sit there and listen it's interactive yeah. I appreciate that yeah we try and build the conference so that it makes it's building community mm-hmm. in partnership with learning. And so these are bringing together the people that are doing the work right. on the ground. Mm-hmm. It's folks that are fundraising in government. It's people that are working to bring in federal funding dollars to yeah. the state. It's you know all of the organizations that are actually rolling out these programs mm-hmm. and services mm-hmm. and bringing everyone into the same room and the importance of, as you mentioned, the facilitators yep. in that room to be able to help move that conversation to here's where we are, how do we move it to that next stage? Yeah. Like, what are, what are the ways that we can partner? How do we start to look at this in a different perspective? Because it's really hard when you're, you don't, a lot of us don't have the luxury of having the 10,000 foot view. Right. Because when you're doing hard work, it's, I mean, it's emotional. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's hard to see sometimes. And when you're dealing with some of the issues that we have, uh, it can be, 
it can be a challenge right. to keep yourself going. And what I like about this conference is that it's really energizing yes. and you get to meet people that, you know, can be lasting relationships that will help you along your path. Yeah. Yeah. I made a couple of different connections. So that's another thing is when you go into the room, don't just sit by somebody, you know, maybe for the first coffee, but uh, reach out to people because the attendees make themselves make the, make themselves available. Absolutely, for sharing and for learning. Um, Congresswoman Stansbury was there, and she mm -hmm. did her one of her most robust discussions on federal funding and accessing and, and answering questions from the audience. And then her staff was there most the whole time too. So I appreciated that level of participation. Um, and then additional funders also were. Um, participating along with everybody else instead of just watching, you know? Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It's, it felt, it felt like really the community, the social sector was really coming together and it's new to us. Mm. I think that's the thing we need to, to recognize is that we're, you know, we're at the beginning stage of all of this. Yeah. And while we've, we've been in this, nonprofit philanthropic dynamic mm -hmm. but not part of a shared ecosystem mm, yes and same with how we come to government it's mm -hmm. government is over here and we're over here yeah. being served not active and so how do we kind of lift that and bring everybody together mm -hmm. so that we are engaged and and Congresswoman Stansberry. I mean, she was, that was one of the takeaways that I loved about her talk was, uh -huh. you know, she, if she wanted something done, she went and picked up the shovel to go and build that community garden or whatever needed Very to be true. done. Um, so this, it feels like that, you know, mm -hmm. we just, we come together because we're all ready to do the work. Mm -hmm. And it, it just felt like a very connecting place where you could make those, you know, the business card that you got, it wasn't like just getting tossed in the purse. It was like, oh, something came of this. Yeah. We've, we've made a new connection and now we're doing this next project and it's really amazing. And yeah. It's, yeah, we're, and one of the, the evaluations we got to was, you know, more time. People just want more time. Right. And so this, this third conference, we're actually bringing in um, more facilitators. Mm -hmm. And so removing some of those panel discussions and really making this engaged so that okay. we do start relationship building as part of this conference, that it's really facilitated networking. Yeah. I can see why that would be purposeful and and useful of the time. People don't, people can only hold still for so long anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I appreciate also that you mentioned some of the takeaways and some of what you would do next time because I was going to ask that anyway. Um, and, and maybe I'll just save the rest for just enjoying the conference itself because I know that I'm looking forward to being there. Um, we're, we're shockingly up against some time here. Oh my so. goodness. Goes um, quickly. Yeah. And, and just as maybe a miniature wrap about that particular topic, sorry, I've been sitting at my desk for way too long today. Um, what you're saying about how we aren't used to this and this is new kind of is, is really, it's a journey that we're on. Yeah. And not just as a sector, but as, as people who are in it every day and, and face the challenges, sometimes you can't see past the challenges, you know, everything from learning more about trust-based philanthropy to, um, having more of a, um, asset mindset. What's the word I'm looking for? Abundance. Abundance mindset. These are, um, not something you do overnight or, or get accustomed to. And, mm -hmm. and I think the way through that journey is very, very much the relationships and partnerships that you, that and Groundworks are trying to build. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's good to get connected with community because it's it's hard work mm -hmm. and it's always nice to know when you can share that burden with somebody else. Right. Yeah, I agree. So I'm looking forward to the city partaking more in just what Groundworks is offering, but then us yeah. also, you providing a space for me, <laughs> for my <laughs> colleagues to brainstorm about some, where we are seeing some gaps and where we can wor be working better together. Yeah. Uh, I was very happy to convince somebody to use some of our money to become a member oh, officially nice. of Groundworks after three years of trying. Um, but you know, it's one of those things where, um, 
it's just putting in a little bit of time and like you said, getting to know some of the community. And that's where I'm at too, is listening a lot to our community partners that the city has. And then where I can see Groundworks coming in to kind of facilitate and support that work that might be very different from what one of the foundations would do or what one of the nonprofit sector um, support systems would do you know, as, as separately. Yeah, we, we, one of the things that we try and do is really act as a neutral body. Mm -hmm. And so it can be an easy way to um, help go over, you know, get over the challenge of something when we're not invested in the same way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like when you use a mediator. Right. Sometimes you need that sort of neutral party to be able to, maybe it's um, to host a community fair or it's Good facilitate a, a meeting, mm -hmm. but it's it gives a little bit of that removal um, can kind of help overcome some yeah. of those challenges that one particular lens might not be able to get to. I appreciate that and I will take advantage of that. So um, as we come to a close, Christy, yeah. is there anything that you want to be sure that people are aware of or uh, maybe that you're most excited about for the rest of the year? Something that um, you want to leave us with? Sure. Uh, I will leave you with the Center for Nonprofit Excellence has just hired a new manager of learning nice. and education, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Faith Kelly, Miss Faith. Ms. Faith, and she is off to a fabulous start. And we are about to announce our community calendar. So we have nonprofit essentials, which are running um, that will be one hour webinars that will give you basic tools on whether it's volunteer Great. management or perhaps it's uh, fundraising and grant writing. Mm -hmm. So wealth of classes there. We're doing some larger seminars, which okay. are in person. These are going to be across the state. Um, so like our webinars, they're available to anybody anywhere, but the workshops we're going to be taking on the road. So oh. look for us down in Las Cruces, Silver okay. City. Uh, we're going to be up in Española soon. So we've got some really great um, workshops that are coming up. And so just, um, you know, making sure that boards, nonprofit staff, and um, the philanthropic community staff are resourced and on the best practices. Right. Yeah, I love that. So can you keep an eye out for the community calendar on your website? And maybe mm -hmm. if people haven't already signed up for your newsletter, they should. Yeah, and you yeah. can sign up for the newsletter, a membership, or register for our classes at yes. groundworksnm, as in New Mexico, dot org. We'll put that in the notes. Cool. They say. So um, I would call for a second interview because I'd love to learn more just about you and, and the actual accent of your work and what makes you happy. Oh, I would love to come back anytime. In addition to this work. I know this work makes you happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Christy. Thank you, Mariah. This was great. My pleasure. And uh, again, this is Mariah Harrison with ABQ Accent, and we hope everybody comes back to hear another accent. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.